Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ryan. I'm the chair of EMPA. Welcome to our um, panel for today. We're coming to you from Toowoomba in Queensland. So we honour and respect the Waka Waka, Jarraware and Gaibal people who are the First Nations custodians of land where we're all meeting. Um, we acknowledge and recognise the significance of our shared history and we support the continued connections of First Nations people uh, to country. So um, welcome today. I hope you will all share in the chat where, who you are, where you're from, and also um, uh, what organisation you're with. Um, we are looking at principle number six today. Uh, the EMPA principles were formed uh, at the start of last year, and they were a, the product of a really long uh, engagement process with a range of members and um, communication experts in this field. And today, principle number six is working with media and social media providers, so from liaison to collaboration. Our guests today are Ben Shepherd, who's media manager with Rural Fire Service New South Wales, Chantel Rule Murphy, who's executive manager of media with Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, and Dante Checon, who's news producer with Channel 7, based in Brisbane. Ben is a longtime media manager with the Rural Fire Service, and we, uh, we see him at the conference every year. He was a critical member of the team that worked on the 2019-2020 bushfires that covered so much of New South Wales. He was also a central media contact in fires like Tathra and Winmalee. He was part of the media team that won one of the highest accolades in New South Wales for their work in the Black Summer fires. Chantelle made her start in journalism at the ABC in Brisbane in the early 2000s, but quickly found a more exciting opportunity in the land of fire and emergency services. She has worked in Queensland emergency services media teams now for more than 15 years and has led media and public information efforts for more than 30 cyclone events, as well as the state's largest flood and bushfire disasters. Chantelle has worked at all levels of incident management from the front line through to state operations. She's currently the acting executive manager of Queensland Fire and Emergency Services media team, which runs a 24-7 service for media and public information response. Dante is a news producer, mainly for the 6pm bulletin at Channel 7 in Brisbane, but also works on special reports. He drove Seven's role in coverage of the Brisbane floods last year and more recently produced special broadcasts on the police murders um, in the Western Downs, Weambilla area. Today we're talking about principle number six, um, which says media agencies, journalists and people working in media and social media to collect with and collect and create content are actually our partners in disaster communication. Sometimes it's doesn't feel like that. How can we develop trusted relationships and effectively collaborate with these people to support, guide and empower the community? So welcome to the panel. Um, starting with Dante, can um, each of you run through the most recent event that you worked with media on or worked with agencies on? And, um, and just give us a bit of um, background on, on what your experience was during that, that um, event. So Dante, over to you. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Um, I'm really pleased I can talk to you about all of this. It's, it's such a great initiative. Um, look, my um, most recent experience um, hasn't been in natural disasters, but um, has been in uh, more of a police scenario, which was the, uh, the police ambush, ambush mur murders of um, of uh, two two constables and um, a, uh, a hero neighbour in the Western Downs of Queensland, uh, not far from uh, Toowoomba, not far from Brisbane. Uh, that happened in uh, December last year, and um, it was really quite. It started as uh, there were so many unknowns to begin with. I remember as the story broke, um, we were hearing tip offs of. Uh, particular uh, shooting event that there wasn't uh, any uh, response from officers uh, on the ground and in the newsroom we kind of frantically tried to get as much information as we could we we uh, happened to have a, uh, a freelancer out um, in the chinchilla way which is not too far from where it all happened and um, and he started heading straight out there but of course we had no idea what 
the extent of this particular story was was going to be. We had just heard that there had been shots fired. Um, so we managed to break the story uh, on our 6 p.m. news that night. It was uh, we we crossed to our reporter just using FaceTime. So this is the new world we're in. The 6 p.m. news is no longer. Uh, you know, completely uh, ca professional cameras and everything like that. If we can get someone on FaceTime or Zoom like this, uh, we'll use that now. Um, and we were managed to managed to get it on air, broke the story. Um, some difficulty there. We we didn't know how dangerous the situation was. We um, we got as close as we could, and we we were able to talk to police, and um, and and we were pushed pushed right back, which rightly so, because the the police had had no idea uh, what the true extent of it was as well um and in the days that followed we really had to balance um how we were uh dealing with the community with the police officers their families um and how they were struggling with what had happened um the community was really interesting to be able to uh, to work with because um I think a lot of you could could probably appreciate when something happens in a smaller community and then the media kind of flocks to it. Um, it can be quite a shock for those people and and there can be a bit of a, a, a strange relationship there when, when the media uh, turns up. So yeah, it was really interesting to be able to manage that, that kind of relationship with the community. Um, further on, as we went through that, that process um, certainly during that whole experience we were taking um, police press conferences live on the main channel um, as well as on social media so social media has become a real important tool in that regard we just want to get information out there as quickly as possible so whenever um, emergency uh, response teams police anyone is having a, a, a press conference we will take that live on all our social media platforms and depending on the significance, we'll take that on uh, on the terrestrial channels as well. Um, when it came to the funeral of the uh, the two constables involved, we um, we did a special broadcast. It was a um, really a team effort between all the networks um, here in Brisbane. Uh, a huge event at the uh, Brisbane Entertainment uh, Centre that um, was attended by the Prime Minister, the, the Governor. Uh, the premier um, and of course uh, there was thousands of police officers there too so there was a huge security and logistical operation um, but that aside the 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 funeral that we did a special broadcast on was largely driven by the families um, it was their moment and we had to be super respectful of of how that um, how that played out and and we worked very closely with police media uh, and um, the families to be able to deliver that in a in a really sensitive way, and that was able to, considering there was such a large public interest, and with the people who were attending, um, we had to make sure that that we could balance that as well. So, uh, look, a really huge and unusual um, event, if I can if I can say that um, for us, but um, a, a great example of how. Um, we were able to work together as media as a whole in this city and um, also with our emergency services to really tell that story, bring people up to date as it developed and then eventually um, uh, end it with the, with the funeral. Thanks, Dante. Um, ben, what was your most recent experience? I, I think the, it, it, it happens uh, just about every single day for us, um, even over the past 24 hours, obviously, with uh, uh, some significant lightning uh, moving through uh, the state. Um, we have a very close working relationship with the media. And, and in fact, it, it's always been very much of our mantra that they are part of the overall effort. Um, and it's quite often that we're actually receiving um, a, information and in, in many cases intelligence uh, from the media themselves because look at, they can be concentrating on on capturing the event as it unfolds and <clears throat> I'm aware of a few people that might be online today uh, where we've got photographers and and um, also camera people uh, that are out there getting imagery um, that really benefits us as well by them sending that information for us to use potentially internally but also on uh, on occasions where they will actually say to us, Hey, feel free to use this. 
we can't be everywhere at once. Um, and I know of a few cases as well where the media have been in, in small villages or towns saying, hey, just letting you know the fire's crossed this road or it's impacting on these homes or you're losing homes here. So we've always in, included them in, in just about everything we do here at the State Operations Centre. Um, when we built this centre, uh, the media was a significant consideration to ensure that they were here and being part of here. They also put a, a, a significant investment in the TV networks by putting um, digital video networks in that cost them each year, but that allows them to do live broadcasting here. And of course, there's an element of, of trust that goes with that. Uh, they have access to information as it's streaming in uh, from our trucks and our firefighters that is clearly visible on the screens on the big screen. Um, but there's always been a little bit of an understanding is we will go out and talk about these kind of things, especially if we see, you know, a truck overrun or, or, or someone injured, we will uh, potentially talk about those things. Um, but just give us the time to also ensure that we can tell those brigade members, their families, um, uh, and, and ensure that we're doing it in the right way so they're not always finding out through the media or social media. And I think the thing, the reason why I love uh, having those relationships as well I don't want to say it gives us an element of, of complete control, but it gives us a little bit of control, things that we don't have now in, in this uh, landscape of social media. Um, and I think, uh, as you touched on earlier there, Bob, that the, the, the Tathra fire was a really interesting one. Uh, when it first took off uh, some of the, the uh, news networks, we all met it at the local station. Um, and we had a bit of a discussion about that. We, what we would try to limit is showing house numbers and street names given there was such a significant impact on that particular town. So we, we said, look, you know, you can, you're still going to film burning houses and everything as well. We understand that. But where you can try and frame out the number or, or, or the street name. Um, what we saw, though, the next day, even though members of the, com <coughs> sorry, the community had evacuated, we had members that didn't. And then what they were doing is walking around town and doing starting to do live streaming and everything as well. So there was a bit of an understanding between the networks. Hey, you know what, they're showing it, therefore we will allow, you know, or not allow, but okay, then let's be a little bit more free about actually talking about people where the impact has been and um, uh, and, and showing homes and streets and everything as well. So look, it, it's always worked well for us. We do media training each and every year. It's well attended. Um, and there's very strong relationships that we've used uh, across the the, the, um, the years, both for our benefit, but also the benefit of, of the networks, the papers, and also now more and more online. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we'll go on to Chantelle now. Um, what's, um, can you recount an experience you've had? Um, I've asked the others for their most recent, but of course, Ben, and probably you are doing this every single day. Um, so, um, yeah. Tell us about your experience, Chantel. Uh, sure, yeah, we do do this uh, quite often. There's always something happening um, right around the state. Uh, in terms of big Ooh. events, our last um, big event was probably the floods that happened almost a year ago now. Um, we have much smaller events that happen throughout the year, but that was probably the last large-scale event that we had. Um, the media coordination up here in Queensland is, is pretty good um, and we have fantastic relationships with media here at QFES. So um, for us, it's all about making sure that that public information is spot on, um, that the communities are getting what they need and obviously journalists and media are the way that we are able to facilitate that. Um, so in those particular floods, we'd been... We hadn't anticipated floods of that magnitude, but we had had several weeks of floods leading up to that event. Um, we'd had an event uh, earlier in January that caught us a bit by surprise, and that was more confined to around Gympie and Maribara area. Um, and the journos were very responsive there. But the thing that makes this work all so well for us is the ongoing relationships that we tend to have with the media. So at QFES, each of our media offices, we have regions throughout the state, seven regions, and our media offices all have a region that they look after and um, develop those relationships with media and our internal staff um, because we do also have an open media policy here at QFES as well. So it does mean that everyone is allowed to speak to the media to the benefit of the organisation. And we find that that works really well 
at least 95% of the time. Uh, we're not really getting people who are saying things that they shouldn't in media too often. So um, it does make it a lot easier for us in terms of accessibility during incidents um, for media as well. Uh, and we find that in the large scale incidents, it cuts down a lot of um, red tape that would otherwise be there that we don't have time to get through um, when we do have a big incident unfold. So operating in that way day to day really helps us um, because we're not changing our processes at all when it comes to a large scale event. Okay, I'll start with you, Ben. Um, you've been at RFS New South Wales for a long time. Have the relationships with media always been that beneficial? Yeah, look, I think from the early 2000s when we saw obviously that they were going to cover fires regardless um, and, and we started introducing the, the bushfire awareness training, um, that, look, we recognise that it gives us another arm of, of intelligence from the field and then by <clears throat> ensuring that we're working with them, we can ensure that, that we're getting out our key messages and key warnings and advice to the community. So <clears throat> uh, as Dante will know, if, if we're not providing that, they're going to find another way in, in order to get into the fire ground to actually find the story. And again, if we can provide that and give them that access and actually give them what our key messages are, they help broadcast the overall uh, sort of call to action that we want the community to do. So it, it's it, it, the hardest thing, um, I guess, over the last few years, there have been such considerable cuts to the media it, it's, it's changed a little bit in the way that now we're seeing so many freelancers that are doing it for the dollar. Um, sometimes they, that they might be looking at taking unnecessary risks in order to get the shot or get the imagery. Whereas traditionally with the networks, we've had a little bit more control on saying, hey, look, we'll line someone up, but can go to this point, go to this point. Whereas there, there's a few more freelancers that are out there now that we're, we're having to keep in uh, the back of our mind, well, where are they? What are they doing? So it, it, it's it's always an interesting and changing dynamic, but if you're not going to assist, then ultimately as well, you can't expect them to, to necessarily, um, I don't want to say play by the rules, but you, you can't expect to know where they are and what they're doing. And also therefore being be, being able to provide the best advantage points or, or, or actually the best bit of uh, area or safest areas to go to. So what's your experience, Chantelle? You've been there for quite a while too. Have you seen a change in the um, in the um, relationship between QFES and media? Yeah, uh, I have. There was once upon a time where you would um, turn up to a fire and all the media that turns up are the same media that turn up week in, week out, very easily identifiable. Uh, there's a bit more time to... Um, get their stories to air, they're not so pressed by deadlines, whereas now what we're seeing, obviously, with the um, rise in social media and uh, online content is that those deadlines are just gone. Um, the deadlines are always immediate and there's so many different ways to get that story. So as Ben was saying, we do have a lot of freelancers um, working around the place as well, but citizen journalists as well and people providing content um, to media outlets um, is something that we talk to our guys about all of the time. Uh, there will always be someone fi um, filming and if we're not participating in that space, then somebody is going to speak um, about the incident. So if we're the ones leading the incident, then we want our people to be speaking about that. So for us, it's about empowering our people to feel comfortable with speaking to the media and giving them the skills to be able to do that whenever they turn up to a job. And it also expecting that, you know, they're always going to be filmed and it's okay that that's happening. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of um, nervousness around being caught out and not um, being perceived to be doing the right thing. Um, but we all know that our people are always trying to do the right thing when they're out on the ground as, as well. So um, we do remind them that, you know, you're all human. Um, humans make mistakes. Most of the time you're not going to. Most of the time no one's going to see any of that um, for themselves, but there's always a chance um, that your um, the vision that you don't necessarily want people to see could end up in the media, um, but we will deal with that as well. So it's for us, it's a lot about 
um, reassuring people and working with the media then um, to make sure that they have everything they need because that's like Ben said that's a much better position for us to be in because there's going to be a story either way. Okay I wanted to explore that social media idea a bit more. Ben earlier talked about intelligence and I wanted to ask Dante um, the media uses social media as a source quite a lot now um, how much does that um, sort of, how does that work for them? Are you constantly scanning or does this just pop up? How does that work in your day-to-day um, -day production of stories on, on disasters and emergencies? It's, um, it has changed, it has changed us so, so much. I mean, these things are um, your best friend and your worst enemy for us in so many ways because um, it's, it's how we put a story together together these days um everybody everybody has a phone and everybody's filming and it doesn't matter what's happening in front of them they've got their phone out and they're filming so um i'm i'm thinking more recently the sea world disaster the helicopter crash that uh, happened just after new year's um here in in on the gold coast happened in the broadwater beautiful summer's day thousands of people are there and thousands of people have their phones out and so there's there's so many different angles um you know of that particular uh, incident and um you really have to be careful about and curate what you can show and what's accurate and whatnot so um yeah to your question uh, it's so important to what we do now we we i actually can't think of how we would do it how we would put news together without citizens punters out there shooting on their phone because we as ben mentioned we can't be everywhere <laughs> um at all times it's impossible um and um newsrooms it's no surprise newsrooms have shrunk <laughs> and are, are, are getting smaller so we're relying on the resources of people out there and um and what we're starting to do more as well is is as I mentioned before, if, if you can't get an interview with someone, you are FaceTiming them while they're in the moment or while they're on the scene. So you're getting more direct uh, information from people on the ground, um, you know, quicker. And how much does that feed into the any intelligence that you put back to agencies and police? Yeah, so that's, that's key because we will get... If, the, if there's a major event happening, the first we'll hear about it usually is from people on the ground. So um, Twitter was the, the first port of call. People start tweeting about it, maybe less so now. Um, more people are sending, will send us a Facebook message. They'll, they'll email us. Um, people don't pick up the phone as much and call the newsroom as they once did. <laughs> they'll, they'll Facebook message us. So, um, uh, so we'll get that information and we'll get start, we'll put a reporter on it and they'll start calling around. Um, the first person they'll call is the person that's messaged. They'll get some information. Um, we'll try and get as much information from the the people on the ground first, and then we'll go and then we'll go to the emergency services and we'll say, "Hey, this is the information we've got. What can you tell us? What can you firm up?" Um, hopefully, in that time, we've made it to that to that scene of of that particular event, um, and we can start working with the emergency crews on the ground um, to to firm up information. But yeah, it's 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 critical that we do take the information from from people out there and present that to um, to the authorities because we don't want to be going to air with something that somebody thinks they saw or somebody believes happened. Uh, we need to make sure that it's accurate and and fair and and so that is a huge part of what we do and mm -hmm. and the the turnaround of that is um, has to be pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the pressure. I can't imagine the pressure. <laughs> um, Chantel, I'm just wondering if you could talk about um, some of the obstacles you experienced getting that um, those media relations established. Were they systems? Were they people? How, how did that all come together and, and what were you faced with on that journey? Yeah, um, I think for us the biggest challenge that we face is um, is journalists moving in and out of emergency services rounds quite quickly so and moving around the place a lot as well so um, normally we will find that it's just developing the relationships um, that said though uh, it, 
in our experience, most of the people in our team are former journalists themselves. Um, and so there's the relate, relatability that we already have um, with people. But at the end of the day, to break it down, we're all just doing a job and we're wanting to put our best foot forward. And so I think as communicators, we're, we're pretty blessed with um, some good people skills. And so uh, being able to generate those relationships um, can happen fairly quickly. I think it's the deeper part of that, that trusting relationship, the person so that you can be able to have the conversation with a journo um, when perhaps they don't have um, quite the right um, angle for what's really going on and you're hoping to guide them a little bit or there's a contentious issue and you'd like to have a, a frank discussion with them about it those kind of relationships do take a lot longer to develop. And the biggest barrier to developing those, I think, is the transient nature of emergency services rounds. Um, so you'll often develop a relationship with a journalist um, and you'll be talking to them you know, quite freely. And then, you know, three weeks down the track after things are going quite well, they're off in another newsroom mm. and suddenly there's an issue in the newsroom where you would normally have spoken to them and that pops up for that publication and, and then you're talking to someone that you don't have that established relationship with. So I think um, that used to be a lot easier to develop because people would stay on the rounds a bit longer, but now with the nature of newsrooms and people moving around a lot more, we're just not finding that we have those same in-depth relationships all the time. How about you, Ben? What's your experience? Yeah, I guess in some aspects it, it, it's very similar um, that uh, we do uh, tend to see a bit of movement now uh, amongst the, um, <clears throat> the, the newsrooms as well. So I think primarily we look at it in two ways. One is the relationship with the reporters themselves. And we find that, you know, the more that we can provide to them, the easier it makes their story as well. And I think they're very appreciative of that. So saying to them, if they're going out to a, a particular fire, hey, go to this location, speak to this person, but also here's the stats on the fire. So they're not looking for that kind of stuff. So then, you know, that they can get a little bit more colour about what's actually going on. But we think it's very important for them to be there. It, it is funny when sometimes you speak to our own people, they do look at the media and go, you know, why are they here? Um, but as we quite often say, well, the media person standing next to you is appropriately attired. They have to have a level of training. And many of them have probably covered more fires than you've actually been to. But meanwhile, they're happy for the landholder to stand there in a pair of stubbies, a singlet and a thongs, not appropriately attired, probably haven't seen a fire for a long, long time. But they're happy for that landholder to stand next to them, not the media. But it's always been our belief, what I'm very, very strong on as well, I want the media to be there because if there's two, three streets back and they're just trying to explain in words actually what's going on, one photo or 10 seconds of vision that shows the heroic nature of what our people are putting themselves through and our people all being volunteers, you know, that shows that they're risking their lives in order to protect a home or try and stop a fire going through. I want them there next, next to them. But equally as well with the journalists, the, the relationships we always try and foster are with the cause desks themselves and giving them a bit of understanding, hey, today, if you position someone out here, um, you know, it puts them in the best. So even today with the high fire danger through the middle of the state, just having an understanding, especially with those rural reporters, where's our risk, what's going on, and we'll try and give the heads up. But there are conversations going on all the time. Even now as well, we in Sydney, we're really the newsrooms are sharing one helicopter and actually trying to say, hey, should we actually send the yeah. helicopter? And we're trying to give them a bit of an understanding of, hey, our crews are saying that this thing's moving. You might want to put it up, mm. still your decision. I'm not making that decision for you. Your cost, your decision. Um, but as well, it's that relationship saying, hey, no, don't worry. It sounds like they're going to get it under control because we know what they need and want, but we also can benefit from that. And, and quite often as well, when some um, uh, when when uh, news helicopters have been up and we haven't had some, one of our uh, uh, helicopters actually with streaming in footage, that ability just to ring a cause desk and say, hey, can you pan around to the West? We need to see this particular element. They're streaming on Facebook. They still get what they need, but we're also equally getting some information from them as well. So, look, it, it's definitely changing. Mm. God knows where it's going to be in another five or six years. I'm sure they're probably, Dante will be doing 24-hour streaming both online and on a, on a separate network. So he, his job might be safe. But it, 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 it's, it, they're huge demands because people now want to know what's happening every 10 minutes, regardless of where it's a significant change or not. 
Yeah, so Dante, what, how's that resourcing a barrier to you covering, to, and you and your team um, covering, uh, especially natural hazards? You just have to be, I think, a bit more selective about what you can and, and can't do. I think sometimes we run the risk of trying to be everywhere at once, but um, it, it's just not possible. And we're stretching our teams. And, we, and I remember a year ago now, um, the Brisbane floods happened and you're working, I mean, the emergency services are the, the people who work the hardest, but, you know, we're also... Uh, you're working 10, 11, 12, 14 days straight, lo really long hours. So you've got to be really careful about how, you, how your team responds. So you don't want to be stretching them too much. So you, you need to be selective about where you are. So that's where it's really important that we have information coming in from um, the, the fireys or the police to tell us th these are the areas where, uh, you know, where it's safe, where it's of most concern. Um, and we kind of get that information and we get the information from the people on the ground and we kind of weigh up, where do we need to be? How does that work? So certainly, um, you know, the, 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 the chopper is a, a great example been made there that um, that's a shared resource now between networks. Uh, once upon a time, we could just send it anywhere and they'd land and you could jump out and, <laughs> but um, you can't do that anymore. So um, yeah, you just have to be, you have to be really selective about where you're going and, and who and who you're talking to. And, and I mean, at the end of the day for television, what we're after is pictures, right? So we just want pictures to be able to tell the story. And, um, you know, sometimes we might have to send uh, the, to the chopper to a fire, which uh, perhaps isn't the most significant fire, but it provides us some television pictures to be able to tell people that there's a high fire risk or a high fire danger. So, um, while sometimes it might come across that we're uh, going to things that are insignificant, there's a reason. It's because we need to be able to tell a story. We can't just put black air, black, black to air. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a really important consideration too. Yeah, those visuals are so important. And um, in the research that I've done as a um, natural hazards researcher, visuals are a key to getting people to do to undertake some sort of behaviour. So. Ben and Chantel, how have you incorporated that need for in, uh, visuals into your um, media management? How do, how do you um, sort of get make sure that's front and centre? Uh, go, Ben. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> look, you'll probably notice as well from the social media uh, aspect, we try to share as much as we can visually. So anything that we get from our firefighters on the ground, you know, we're making available on social media. It's not unusual then for media outlets to say, hey, can I get that? Or have you got a little bit more? But equally as well, and sometimes frustrating to, to some of our um, the incident management team, hey, can you get us some footage or some imagery from the fire ground? Because we know to your point that it gets shared more. It, it actually helps with our, our broadcasting of actually what's going on. Interestingly as well, there's been a bit of a shift. You know, we, we, we share imagery like what we call line scans of where the fire is actually up to. Going back probably a decade or two, that was considered, no, that's information for us. No one needs to necessarily see that. But if we've got it, uh, most of our comms team will argue, well, hang on, that, that could also benefit the community as well. So why would we not show it? So I think there's, there's a real shift on, 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 you know, holding information just for ourselves to help us make operational decisions but also looking at things and going, okay, well, we can actually share that. It's striking that balance though as well, because um, sometimes as well, we won't want to necessarily show pictures of homes burning or be able to provide that. If the networks get that, that's up to them. But we do also things like motor vehicle accidents when people have been seriously injured or killed, we're not going to necessarily share imagery like that. But if there has been a significant motor vehicle accident and it's blocking a highway during the Christmas period and the driver's okay, then we might. So it, it's understanding what our purpose is and also then making those that bits of vision and, and, and photography available to the media, but also allowing them to, to actually rule at their own game as well. So it, it gives us a little bit of arm's length to, to, to things that might be considered, um, I guess, a little bit prickly or a little bit um, uh, sensitive. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd agree with what Ben um, is saying about the conversations having to be had around um, 
making sure that we get as much imagery out as possible. Certainly having secondary confirmation for the community is really important. So when they're being told that something's particularly dangerous, you want to be able to back that up with some sort of imagery. So having images of those fires is really important for us as well. And it's always a little bit of a struggle to get that from the ground. Um, as Ben say, you kind of need to call in incident controllers and, and ask them to do it because it's not necessarily front of mind for them at that point in time. So where we can, we like to have a connection with either the incident controller or somebody they delegate or put one of our own people out there to work on that because we know that um, the demand is really high um, for images and for visual. Um, so if we can have someone there actually focusing on that, we're going to get a better information flow and then it supports the information that we're putting out. We know that it goes a lot further. We've got a team at the moment over in New Zealand um, assisting with the flood um, response there uh, after the cyclone that went through. And the images that are coming back from that are incredible and they're getting a huge, huge um, reach on social media for us at the moment. Um, and people need those visuals to make their own minds up about information. So when we're saying to them things like today's a really high fire day today and uh, we need you to do X, Y, Z, um, they need to firstly have trust in your message, which you've hopefully built in the off season over time. And we are very fortunate to be in the position where there's a level of inherent trust, um, but they also require some sort of um, visual a lot of the time as that secondary confirmation, like I said before, to back up that decision making and go, oh, actually, yes, I can see those flames are getting into the tops of the trees. Yep, this really is serious. It's not just some little thing far, far away. Um, just on those, um, the topic of visuals, Kim Palmer has asked about um, verification, especially when you're in a really fast moving environment. So I'll start with Dante on that one. Yeah, again, like as I said before, you don't, you don't want to be putting to where images that are from a different event or has happened at a different time. And, and you, you've probably seen that happen, you know, where, where there's been some sort of crash and someone's used what something from America or something like that. Yeah. You have to, you have to, you have, you have to verify. It. And, um, and you do that by seeing people on, on the scene. I mean, where are you getting those videos from? So are you picking that video up off Twitter or off, the internet somewhere, there's going to be a high risk there that that is not accurate or it's from somewhere else or it's 10 years old. Or, um, But if you've got something from someone on the ground, your reporter's talking to um, someone who was there at the scene at the time, um, you, you, you're likely, that's likely to be more, um, you know, accurate, I guess. Um, obviously, uh, vision that comes out from um, our local emergency services. I know Chantel, we had we we used the QFES vision this week of of the teams in New Zealand. We know that's we know that's accurate because that's come from the authorities, and we have one hundred percent trust with them that that is uh, good to go. And same with our police. So we have a great police media team here in Queensland, which provide um, plenty of uh, vision, especially when there's something big happening. Um, they've got their own teams to be able to do that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, you have to scrutinise everything. You can't just trust what you take off the internet. And there's a range of ways you do that. And it starts with just talking to people on the ground, really. Ben, what's your um, angle on verification? How do you guys do that? Yeah, look, so, so primarily what the, the stuff that we are sharing does tend to come from our own firefighters or what we know as trusted sources. So... Uh, for instance, if there's a particular photographer uh, or camera person out there that, that we know and trust and they send us stuff directly, then we tend to use them. And, and we, we do credit their organisation as well. So um, I think that, that, that there is that level of trust. We are currently also using some AI to actually bring in some of those social um, things for uh, some level of uh, intelligence and information. Um, and we obviously then verify it, as it, it with its reliability. So the issue with some things on Twitter, it does tend to strip out some of the metadata that's behind the scenes that shows us when, where and, and direction and everything. Um, but on other platforms, you know, it, it still does exist. So we're looking at how, how we can actually use that. 
Um, but it, it needs to be trusted as well. We need to have a level of trust in it. Uh, and we are continuing to look at, at better ways of doing it. Uh, we see it through things like, you know, apps like Waze and everything as well, where people are uh, reporting on incidents and, and what's actually going on. Um, and again, I think we've covered a couple of times is we can't be everywhere at once. Um, why wouldn't we trust some elements mm. of the community? And by, by, by and large, most of the community want to do the right thing. There's only a few idiots out there that might take a picture that was taken three or four years ago and try and do it uh, and try and share it. But hopefully through some of the RI machines, it will pick up some of the recognition going, hey, that is something that we've previously seen or used. We say that it's unverified or unreliable. Therefore, we're not likely to share it or use it. Chantel? Yeah, where we find... Sorry, I'll unmute myself. Um, yeah, we primarily also use images and footage that come from our own people. Um, however, we have had many instances in the past where um, we've not been able to get imagery back and actually relied upon the media as well to, to provide some of that to us. So I know particularly out of the 2011 um, floods that we had here in Queensland, accessibility was really, really difficult. And so we did have instances where media were streaming back from helicopters into their newsrooms and they were able to share some of that with us, um, not, not really for our own uses because we weren't on social media at the time, but for intelligence as well. So um, that trusted uh, relationship is really important um, for going both ways. And I know Ben spoke to that before as well. Um, in regards to verification as well, one of the things that we love to do that we know gets a lot of reach on um, social media is anything to do with animals. So in our big incidents and our most um, recent ones have obviously been flooding incidents. If we ever get any footage that involves some sort of animal where it shouldn't be, um, then that always goes bananas and we can attach safety messaging to that. I know we had one last year of a shark in a park um, and the, so we put that with um, a safety message about kids playing in, in the water and the nasties that could be in there, including the shark. Um, that one um, gets picked up and carried all around the place. But for our primary audience, which is our locals, it, it pushes it into their feed a lot more easily, um, even when it has that, um, you know, sort of international reach, it still has that added benefit of getting much better reach in a community that's affected. Um, and then uh, in Mackay most recently, um, we had another animal, I think it was a croc by the side of the road, and we've had the bull shark on the highway um, after Cyclone Yasi uh, that went um, sorry, that was Cyclone Marsha that went um, absolutely crazy too. So, um, Dante talked about um, the Queensland Police Media and we've got a pretty curly question here from Nick Moore. Um, the inquiry into the Lismore New South Wales um, floods led by the former New South Wales Police Commissioner suggested that police should lead natural disaster coordination in New South Wales. He says, historically, they are far less agreeable to press in disaster zones than other emergency services, and many media are concerned that that will hinder access. Can we have some thoughts from the panel? So we'll start with Dante on that one, because Queensland's going to a similar system in, uh, in the end of this financial year, year with SES moving over um, under the police umbrella. So it's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, look. It, it can be it can be tricky, um, uh, and there's obviously always operational reasons why um, uh, police, in particular, uh, don't want to share information or or, or want to give out uh, give out extra information. Obviously, legal matters are another another aspect. I mean, um, that's a that's a that is a curly one. It's a difficult one for me, for me to answer. I think. Um, I think perhaps there are maybe there maybe there are some benefits of of everyone being under one in, uh, one umbrella, but I can certainly see how different um, different agencies have their strengths and and can can play to that. I I I don't see how I mean in, in a natural disaster situation, um, the fire and rescue teams have so much have such a different responsibility than than police do, and and different information sources, and then you're talking about weather and um 
So I might, my personal opinion is that um, the, the status quo is probably the way for us to go. Uh, but I don't know what it's like in New South Wales. I haven't worked out enough to, to know. Mm. So um, sorry, I'm not particularly great to answer that question. Ben, uh, um, do you have any comment on that one? Yeah, look, it's just a problem from Nick, probably no one else. But um, <laughs> look, Nick, Nick, Nick is obviously one of the a photographer that we um, have a good working relationship with. Look, the main thing I think that from that, we still have statutory responsibilities for the issuing of information or warnings. That won't be diluted what we through what we know as the PIFAC arrangements. PIFAC is there to offer support to the combat agencies. So very much it, it will still be at, at our determination about uh, access to and from fire grounds. We will always push that. I know that there's a bit of a different, um, sometimes a bit of a different relationship with police, in particular when you do look at crime scenes. Not often do they lifting up the tape to all the media to come on in, but they play a very, very different role in the broadcasting of information and warning. So we will always fight for that, that level of access. We will always have those conversations also with police. So there's a whole process here in New South Wales with media uh, access to fire grounds. Um, with that level of accreditation, we, we educate the police in, in, in the role that they play. Uh, when, when trying to gain access through roadblocks, you know, that we talk to them about showing their accreditation card and, and they're actually um, dressed appropriately. And we have mechanisms in place if they aren't granted access uh, that we actually talk with the police liaison officers here. But it is always done in consultation with the incident controller for that incident. So we have had days, catastrophic fire danger days, where we've said to the media quite early in the, in the day, we are not doing anything to get you on the fire grounds today. Ultimately, it is too risky. Whatever you choose to do is up to you, but you aren't going to be allowed through roadblocks or, 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 or through in, into restricted areas. However, at other times, we're, we're looking to do that. So we're, we're, we will be fighting that, that there won't be any change to that, but also uh, legally as well, or, or statutory obligations for us as an agency, that still rests with us. Chantel? On mute, Chantel. Sorry, I thought I unmuted myself. Um, from a state that already um, has this in place, so in Queensland, um, our disaster management arrangements are locally led. Um, and then as they scale up, police are actually already the lead um, on the, that disaster response once it gets to a district and a state level. Um, so we've operated under that arrangement for a very long time. The great thing is, um, I mean, to talk about anything great in disasters, one of the great things you do see in disasters is everyone working together. So uh, there is a um, emphasis put on making sure the public understands exactly what's going on. So that's where I think you see the real difference between police in their normal operations where they've got a lot of legal obligation and things that can't be said and the change then that you see in an emergency situation where we really want people to see what's going on and to understand that within... Um, appropriate health and safety um, considerations, of course. So you will always continue to see whoever is in charge of that particular, we call it like a work site. So when uh, media come onto a fire ground, that's the firefighters work site and they are responsible for the safety of the media for anyone that comes onto that fire ground. Um, the same exists for any sort of disaster. Whoever is in charge of that disaster is responsible um, at that particular site for the people that are there as well. And so enforcing things like you can't walk into the flood water right now because it's putting your um, safety in jeopardy um, is still going to exist no matter who is there. But I think the information sharing you will see um, from this uh, change in New South Wales um, would be one that I, it's not going to be the same as police operating in other parts of their work. Um, that's certainly not what we see in Queensland. And with the movement of SES over to um, QPS and elements of disaster management also moving over to QPS um, sometime in the near future, um, we're going, I don't think we'll see a lot publicly change and a lot for the media change in terms of accessibility. Um, the fire service will still have uh, quite a strong role, particularly in swift water response. So all of the access that's already granted to sites like that will continue to be. And I would say um, from a police and council perspective, it would be similar. 
Um, Misha from New Zealand, I'm assuming Misha's from New Zealand, is asking about, um, you know, that thing we used to have called business as usual. <laughs> How did you use that to develop? What did you do in that those periods to build relationships? Um, Chantel, I'll start with you. Yeah, so one of the things that we really like to focus on is, um, is making sure that people understand that our people aren't just waiting for a disaster to happen, <laughs> that there is a lot that happens outside of that. So we work with our media to showcase that and that's our opportunity to provide education and to develop relationships. So it's a bit of a multi-pronged approach when we move from reactive mode into proactive mode. Um, so uh, what we do is we identify opportunities where we have training, exercising, skills maintenance, um, graduations, human interest stories, uh, quirky rescues, anniversaries, all of that sort of thing. They're the things that we pick up and say, okay, what can we do with the media with this? And who can we talk to in the media about this? Who's going to do a good job? And sometimes that can be um, the local media coming out to a local station and having a chat with crews, which, as we all know, once you have that face-to-face -face interaction away from an incident, um, you get to know someone a little bit and de just develop that natural rapport. So then when there is an incident down the track, you see the same person, um, you've already got a little bit of a basis there. So chipping away at that for us is really important. We also take a hyper-local approach to media. So um, we're trying to connect in with the smaller um, media publications and broadcasters as much as we can because we know that locals listen to them and it also helps our own people because then it doesn't seem as daunting if they're speaking to Jane from the local radio station as it does to have you know, the Today Show turning up at your big incident six months later. So we encourage our people to practice um, uh, media opportunities with their local people as well. And then that also helps with education. So as I was saying before, um, we've seen journalism to be a very a transient in, in terms of where people are positioned and what rounds they're on. So taking the opportunity to break down some of the jargon that we have by inviting people out for things like ride-alongs on a normal day or come out to the station and learn a bit about all the equipment on the truck and then they'll hear what it's called as well. Um, yeah. And you can have the time then to break that down and educate them. And it gives the benefit then of your stories possibly um, being a lot more accurate than mm. if they didn't have that opportunity. Okay. Ben, what do you do in business as usual times to develop relationships? Yeah, look, I think we're, we're very much the same. Those opportunities of station openings, tanker handovers, medal ceremony, so all those things. Um, and on top of that, obviously, each year, our big for three weeks, we run annual bushfire uh, media training. Um, and the media are required to undertake that training every three years. So it's always, always an opportunity to see out there who's new. So we go... We travel through regional New South Wales um, and we also do a, a week-long session here. So it, it just enables us to see who's out there, what they're up to, and also gives that opportunity to, to also give a little bit of what we're thinking for the for the upcoming season. So um, otherwise, it, it is, it's very much the same. It's, it's just those opportunities. And, and look, we, we see it in the way that we help provide those uh, bits of information and that, that access during fires then when we ask for a favour to cover a particular station opening or, or anniversary, then hopefully we will get a little bit of media out there to promote the good work that, that, that they're doing in, in that individual brigade. Yeah, so there's lots happening. So yeah. we've got five minutes left and I've got a few more questions to get through. So really quickly, Melissa Williams is asking about um, how you use media in an instance like the East Cape Hawke's Bay um, circumstance where they were without communications uh, for six to seven days because uh, fiber optic cables were cut and there was no cell phone coverage. Um, so Ben, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, look, we operate like most people um, under what we know as the public liaison system. So we're always evaluating the best way of, of actually communicating with the public. Obviously things like traditional radio um, very much plays a role during those times, but we also uh, lean on things like community meetings 
um, community meeting points, information chaos. So if you're seeing a degradation in your ability to do it in one particular method, then we've got all these other channels available to us. So um, th there's no doubt the best way that we find of communicating with people is what we know community field liaison and door knocking people and actually saying, hey, this is what's actually happening, but giving them those opportunities to actually come together and um, and actually ask questions of us as an agency about what, what's actually happening, what are we doing? So we don't ever use one in isolation. If we're providing information to the, uh, to the, to the media, then that information should also be available on things like our website, uh, the Hazards Near Me app, um, so all those uh, all those channels should be try or, or ultimately should be saying the exact same thing at the same time. So just a clarification on that, Ben, that would be volunteers help you with door knocking. Yeah, and are, very, they, very are they a dedicated team, or do you have you just draw them from the local brigades? Yeah, look, it, it really does depend on the area. Um, some areas around the state do have community field liaison teams already established, and that they've also got units and everything. Otherwise, we'll actually uh, potentially use local brigades, but also other agencies um, sometimes as well. We, we do have those people that just want to provide support and assistance as well. And so we might actually just take members of, of the community or council and everything to help us run those meetings or help disseminate that, that information. Yeah. Chantelle, very quickly, how do you cope with no access to electronics and cell phones, mobile phones? Yeah, I think, um, again, that uh, focus on community is so, so important. And that's where uh, those relationships really come to the fore is in these circumstances where we don't have that accessibility um, further afield. Uh, so making, knowing, taking the time outside of a season to know who was in a particular area is really important because they may be the only people who are able to broadcast anything within that community. So in addition to what Ben was talking about with um, utilising volunteer services and um, people within our own communities from our own service, understanding the media that are there as well because they're also going to be the ones that are looked to in those emergency situations. So making sure that we know who they are and we have a relationship with them prior to those events is really important in case something like this eventuates. Okay, in 30 seconds, Ben and Chantel, if you were to go into a new team, you need to start from scratch on, on building relationships with media. What are the three things that you would be working on? So Ben, you start with you. Jesus. Um, I'd, I'd be looking at existing systems uh, about how they are actually communicating uh, with them, who they have existing relationships with also, um, and also talking with a new team, what frustrations or, 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 or what, what things they saw as issues um, with their existing relationships or exist, exist, existing systems as well. So we continue to look at things. We, we use a system called Voxer to, to actually communicate with, with the media as well. What is it that we can actually do to, to assist us in doing our job better and ultimately with a vision that the community understands what's actually going on and, and their call to action from us? Yeah. Chantelle? Uh, so I, the same as Ben, would look at what is already existing, get a bit of a lay of the land, current um, relationships and systems. I'd also um, scope that out with the journos themselves. So once we understand internally what those relationships are like, go and see what the perception is from the other side as well and how we might be able to strengthen that uh, in the future and then follow through on any of those actions. So making sure that we're, um, like if they're saying, oh, look, you guys are helpful when, um, when we have smaller incidents, but in bigger incidents, um, we can't get hold of you or we can't get access to this. Working on those things to make sure that in the future it's better than it has been in the past. Okay. Thanks, Chantelle. And Dante, what are the three things that work really well about relationships with emergency agencies at the moment for you guys? Just information with hungry for information so as, <laughs> as, as, as open as they can be with us we'll love we love that um and vision like from a television perspective anything we can get that tells a story visually uh, is just it it makes it so much better for us great well thank you all it's been an amazing session again um we've had over 100 people watching um
just a reminder that next Monday we have Disaster Diaries, which is um, you go off and read a very small article, three minute read, and then we'll have a discussion about the term natural disasters and what it means for emergency management. Um, and also our conference, the Australian Conference is Brisbane this year, um, June 7 to 9. So go to the website and have a look. Thank you, everyone.